going on a trip today. I am not going to tell you where we're going because, well, spoilers. But anyway, I've checked the machine. Everything's working. We've got fuel. We've got snacks. I've got my blanket in case it gets cold. And we're off. Did you pack the first aid kit, darling? Because we yes, don't want to Joyce, get caught out like last time, I know. <sighs> Women, backseat time travellers, eh? Ugh. Anyway, let's go. <sighs> we made it. It worked. Oh my god. This is so exciting. Now, I'm just going to put on the cloaking device. Fantastic, because we don't want to be seen, you see. We are in an alleyway into Zurich in, yes, 1920. We are here to visit a place called the Cabaret Voltaire. It was a club that was visited by lots of artists in the 1920s to discuss their new artistic and philosophical ideas. So we're going to go and get a drink and see what we can find, because there might be someone in there we can talk to. Ready? Come on. So here we are. I have a seat and I have a drink. I'm not sure what it is, it's green, but it tastes nice. I think, yes, over there by the stage is a table full of artists. I recognize Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray. Wow, I was hoping they'd be here. They're two artists at the center of the Dada movement, Duchamp having caused a stir three years ago with his fountain exhibit. The Dadaists make something called ready-mades. It's the idea that what art is should be questioned. They were starting to think that visual representation through painting was boring, that ideas were the most interesting part. It's an idea many other artists share today. He presented a urinal on a plinth in a gallery stating that art was about context. It wasn't about what it was, it was about where it was. The fact that the urinal stood in a gallery made it art. He was questioning what art was, what beauty was. The Dadaists declared that their creations were art for the mind, not the eye alone. Man Ray also made ready-mades, but was also a skilled photographer. He made what he called rayographs, a pun on his own name, which were photograms, photography using light-sensitive paper and no camera. He also worked in collage, film and sculpture. Dadaism wasn't just about questioning art, they also questioned the logical movement of music and poetry. They would perform here at the Cabaret Voltaire. Look at the people on the stage in the corner right now. He's dressed in a paper suit and hat. He recites poetry, accompanied by a pianist making strange noises on the piano, and he moves his body in strange angular shapes. They're really pushing the boundaries. Not all that pleasant to listen to, but they are really questioning what creativity is. Well, let's leave them to it and go on to our next destination. Right, are we ready? Flux capacitor fluxing. Off we go! This is going to be very different from the Cabaret Voltaire. Very classy, we must all be on our best behaviour. Let's sneak in behind that ornate pillar. There's another pianist on the stage, but this time he's playing a nocturne by Chopin. I think the club was more fun myself, but it's still an amazing sight. We are now in the Romantic era. And yes, there he is. My sources were bang on with their information. Caspar David Friedrich has travelled from his home in Dresden and is in the audience tonight. And he's with his friend Johann Dahl. They were both important painters in Germany at this time. 
Friedrich both wowed and angered critics with his work Cross in the Mountains in 1808, which for the first time depicted the crucifixion but concentrated primarily on the landscape around it. Love it or hate it, the painting put him on the map. Again, Romanticism was a movement associated with all creativity – painting, poetry, music and architecture. It was a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, a time when people were rebelling against the progress of industry all over Europe and wanted to create works that celebrated nature and emotion. The most famous of these works is of course Constable's The Haywain. Friedrich's work is about a connection between nature and the soul. The emotion connected with seeing a beautiful view and realising just how small and insignificant you perhaps are when face to face with an expanse of ocean or a mountain range. Oh, I love his work, which captured something referred to as the sublime. As a viewer, you can really put yourself in the shoes of the often very small human forms in his paintings. Dahl was heavily influenced by his friend Friedrich. Their work is very similar, but both were brilliant draftsmen. We'll stay for the concert, shall we? It's lovely and warm in here, and I do like a bit of Chopin. Everybody comfy? Fantastic. We are going to park underneath a bridge this time by the river, which is going to be a little bit dodgy because this machine does not like water. Whoa! Everybody alright? That was a bit of a wobbly one, wasn't it? Oh, sorry about that. Gosh, oh, it's chucking it down. That's why it's raining. Wow. Gosh, it looks horrible out there. On dry land, so we're okay. We are under the Port des Arts. It's a bridge on the River Seine in Paris. And yes, 1720. So we're here to visit the Louvre Museum. We're in the middle of the Rococo period, and it isn't a museum yet, but it is an interesting place to visit. Now we're used to seeing it with that great big glass pyramid outside. That's not going to be there yet because that was made in 1989. So it's going to look a little different. But get on your raincoat and let's go and have a look. The Louvre itself is an amazing building. It isn't a public gallery yet. That won't happen until 1793. But it is a place of art. It was once the royal residence but has been a residency for many artists over the years since Louis XIV moved his palace across to Versailles. The building holds many important works in private collection, started by King Francis I. It's such a shame that later this year there's going to be a fire that will wipe out some of these works from history, among them some by Raphael. So I wanted us to walk the halls before that happens. This is the start of the Rococo period. It's a very dramatic and opulent period of art, particularly associated with architecture and furniture. There are lots of scrolling curves and columns, which we would see now as quite embarrassingly over the top. However, there are some beautiful trompe l'oeil paintings at this time. This is art that tricks the eye by creating depth that isn't there, usually in ceilings, to imply that one's house is far grander than it really is and celebrate one's wealth. No wonder the people rebelled in the 1770s. But at this time, the king had masked balls and venerated the theatre in music and art. Jean-Antoine Watteau was a painter who captured this time well, painting ballets and balls and bringing colour and frivolity back to the world of art. His piece, The Embarkation to Cythera, can be viewed here in the Louvre in modern times. Unfortunately, he's going to die next year at the age of 36. But he did leave his mark on the world of art. I think I hear someone coming. Let's get out of here now before we get into trouble. Meet you back at the pod if we get separated. Go on, leg it. Quietly. location is a little bit quieter there's no need for cloaking and costumes here we are on a 
beach in Tuscany and I had to come here to pay my respects to one of my favourite artists of all time. He died on this beach in 1610. Nobody knows how he died, nobody knows why, but I wanted to come here to talk to you about his work and I felt like we deserved a little bit of sun. So don't forget your sun hat and off we go. Michelangelo Merisi de Caravaggio was a Baroque painter who lived a short and chaotic life. He was known for brawling and in 1606 killed a man. Whether this was intentional or not we don't know, but he fled from Rome with a death penalty hanging over him. He died here on this beach, but nobody knows whether he died of illness caused by the lead in his paint or whether in a revenge killing from one of the men he fought with. I love his work because of the way he used light. He applied a technique called chiroscuro, where the transition from light to dark tones is more immediate than usual, creating strong, dramatic shadows. It's a technique that builds theatre, emphasises the darkness and gives that darkness its own power within the image. Caravaggio's death is not the only mystery here. In 1969, his painting Nativity with St Francis and St Lawrence was stolen. It is said that the Mafia was responsible for the theft, but the painting has never been found. A beautifully rendered replica stands in its place in the church in Sicily. But maybe I should look into where it went. We know the date it was taken after all, and where it was taken from. Hmm. Well, as the sun goes down here on the beach, we have a beautiful, dramatic sunset worthy of the man himself. There are other Baroque painters to look at, of course, and like other movements of art, there were some beautiful poetry and music that followed the ideals. But Caravaggio always stands out for me. I saw one of his works in a gallery age 17, and I stood in front of it for such a long time, completely taken by it. Anyway, we must move on to our last stop of this week's adventure. St. Petronilla. There's a priest's tomb in here and a statue was made to mark it that in modern times sits in the entrance of St. Peter's Basilica because it's unbelievably beautiful and because the chapel of St. Petronilla has since been pulled down. It is Michelangelo's Pieta, a depiction of the Virgin Mary holding her son after he has been taken down from the cross. The emotion depicted in this piece is incredible and the craftsmanship in the folds of fabric is exquisite. What's incredible about this piece is that Michelangelo was only 24 when he made it. The figures are out of proportion on purpose, and Mary appears to be as young as her son, but Michelangelo said he wanted to show the serenity of a connection between man and his God, rather than a realistic depiction of death. He called it the heart's image. It's amazing to get this close to it, in modern times, is behind bulletproof glass. St Peter's Basilica isn't finished yet in a modern sense. It'll be another six years before it's completed to the level we see it today and considered the greatest Christian church in history. But it has existed on this spot since the 4th century, with different artists and architects contributing to its construction over the centuries. Of course, we can't come here without popping over to the Sistine Chapel. Be quick, be quiet, and tell me if you see the guards. Oh, it looks amazing. 
It was only finished eight years ago, and the last judgment behind the altar doesn't even exist yet. That'll be painted in the 1530s. The colours are so bright. It isn't how it looks in modern times. It's a fresco, of course. This means it was painted directly onto the wet plaster so that the paint becomes part of the wall. Let's just stay here for as long as we can. There's so much to see. Oh, God, it was chilly in there, wasn't it? Oh, beautiful, but chilly. Yikes. Now, brace yourself for the return trip because this is going to be a big one. 500 whole years. There's going to be some wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. So, brace yourselves. Make sure. Joyce, you got your seatbelts on? Yes, dear. Good. Rocket and I are both Good. fine. Okay. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Ready? Hold on. Let's go.